which is a topic that is, uh, I think, getting uh, increasing interest. Uh, so thank you, Susanna, very much for being with us. And uh, I, I give you the floor. We have one hour, including probably a little slot for questions at the end, but also questions as you go with, if people are very impatient. Yes, please do ask questions while while um, we go. Thanks very much for having me here. I'm I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this and to be able to talk with you. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yeah, I can't. I can see some of you, but not all of you. So I yes. guess that's pretty typical of how how this happens. So what I was going to do, which is a little bit of a repeat, is just to spend the first five minutes talking about the overall project a little bit because it's an excuse for kind of the fast turnaround nature of the study that I'm going to talk to you about on virtual turn tutoring. Um, so when we had COVID-19, I think you all, uh, of course, are familiar with this. In the U.S. anyway, students lost um, more than half a year of learning. There was, well, I can't quite see this. So more than 17 million students lost more than half a year of learning. And there have been some estimates. Let's see if I can do this. Rick Hanischek did a, some estimate. I, I'm not quite sure it's exactly right, but his, his sense was... Um, that the um, students on average lost between two and 9% of lifetime income. And you can kind of bring that up to what that means for GDP in states and big states like the one I'm in, which is California, he projects would be a $1.3 trillion loss if you if we don't make up the, the, the um, learning that was lost during the pandemic. So what to do, we scanned the research base and really found that tutoring seemed to be the only way that we know to um, uh, kind of accelerate individual students' learning uh, at a really fast pace. There's tons of studies, over 100 RCTs of different tutoring programs from before the pandemic, and many of them have strong effects, more stronger effects than other things that are also expensive, like class size reduction, professional development, technology, things like that. Um, it's not really surprising because the thing about tutoring, if you do this intensive tutoring, you build a relationship that motivates and uh, engages students, and then it targets students' abilities. And so you've got this kind of logic, you've got the demand. There was already, um, private investment of over $40 billion in the U.S. Um, right prior to the pandemic. So lots, there was both uh, demand evidence, logic, and research. <clears throat> but it was really clear that it's not all tutoring is effective. We put a lot of uh, money into tutoring as part of a program called NCLB, No Child Left Behind, in about 2000. And um, there was really low participation because it was an opt-in program where parents had to take it up, even though it was free, very few people took it up. It wasn't really implemented with quality. And part of the issue is that it's not so easy to implement in the current system because you need to hire tutors, you need to adjust school schedules, you need to do all of these kinds of things. Plus there was pandemic related fatigue. Um, so, I started this National Student Support Accelerator to try to figure out how to help with the implementation of high impact tutoring, like effective tutoring instead of the opt-in approach. Um, and we did this by doing research kind of about how you implement it well, about the different more cost-effective models um, that are out there and just like, which elements of tutoring are more or less effective. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is one of the studies that came up from there. We also would take the results of our research, but of other research too, and create these tools like checklists and things like that for districts. Like if they wanted to implement, how would they implement? And then we talked to a lot of people about, about this, these kinds of things. Um, we took all those hundred of, uh, studies, RCTs that were out there and kind of um, identified the characteristics of programs that were effective. And they had to do with things you would expect. They were intensive, so they 
happened multiple times per week with the same tutor so that you created that relationship. They were personalized, so they, they used data and good materials, um, and they just had tutors that, that got good support. And then we created the research synthesis in order to create an agenda of what to do. And we, we made partnerships with districts around the country in order to kind of both observe their implementation as they tried to put tutoring in um, to see where the barriers were, schedules, <laughs> that's the big barrier. Aside from money, scheduling is really the, one of the harder parts of it. But recruiting tutors was also hard in different places. Um, now, one of the nice things about doing, making all these partnerships and doing this is that we got to see a lot what was going on and we got, we got these opportunities to run little RCTs that were fast turnaround. But because they were fast turnaround, they weren't necessarily either the ideal one you'd want to do or you were doing it in, in a kind of fast time period. So it might not have been perfect. This one was pretty good, the one I'm going to show you today. But one example, just like of a really simple one, was that we did this um, when one university was providing a lot of tutors, and we just changed how they were recruiting tutors. Like in the message, we took the exact same message, which was like, sign up to be a GS GVSU tutor, and we changed it to something like looking to earn money, sign up to be a GSV tutor. And we just changed that looking to earn money to different things like pro-social, meaning be good to your community, social, have fun with friends, build your CV, those kinds of things. And they were just, we didn't change anything about the money they got or anything, but we got huge differences. So this, this light blue here is the control and the orange is when you put money. And we you can see we almost doubled the click-through rate. We m way more than doubled the submit applications. We, you know, it was kind of more than tripled the hiring and they were, and it didn't affect retention at all. We just got more kids. They weren't worse. They just um, had to, um, I think with college students here, they basically have to earn money in order to, and so, and so the things they think about are earning money, um, uh, they they go through that and then they want to do these socially good things. But having that money first really made a huge amount of difference. And now they're doing that. So, you know, there are little things like that that can help. And then we create these tools and uh, we have <laughs> these stupid tools, these checklists that we have. We've had over half a million users <laughs> use these on our site. So it's actually turned out to be kind of shockingly uh, useful. We're we're basically on the guidance for 19 of the states have our guidance. So it's worked out really well, which is interesting. Okay. So um, whoops, I thought I had a slide in between here. Oh, here we go. Today, we're going to do one of these studies, which is this virtual tutoring for young readers. And um, the background is that there was, there's really quite a bit of evidence of tutoring in early literacy, just like um, the evidence I was talking about before with over 100 RCTs, a good chunk of them are actually in early literacy, just because that's when a lot of tutoring happens. Um, oh, I should say, since I can't see you all, just jump in if you have any questions. Um, and people have summarized this. You get between a, a good size estimate in the meta-analysis between 0.25 and 0.4 standard deviations. What I've learned is it has a lot to do with what test you use, but nonetheless, if they're, these interventions can have really big effect sizes. Um, they're bigger if you've got trained teachers and one-on-one -on -one setting. But almost all existing studies of tutoring, not just early literacy tutoring, rely on in-person tutoring. Of this, there are six studies of online tutoring in developed countries. Four of them are in high are in middle or high school, and the two in elementary are in fifth grade, so much older than like the learning how to read. And they target literacy. They target math, not literacy. So none on on early literacy, even though that's like the biggest place where people do tutoring. So no study that we know of assesses online literacy. 
So why might we care about this or think it's any different? I think that in um, the virtual setting, you've got a, a few cost saving things. In some way, it's, it's run very similar to in person. So you still have a tutor with a student. They just, the student is in school and the tutor is virtual, kind of like we are here. So you're not really saving the cost of the time of the tutor, except that it saves all the transition costs. So it saves the cost of um, a tutor having to go from one school to another, one classroom to another. They just get to sit there and um, uh, do those kinds of things. And those kind of transportation costs for non-full-time employees can be quite big. And there's also a potential for quality improvement if you're able to recruit better tutors because uh, it's online. I think that's one of the bigger uh, ways that it affects uh, quality. Maybe you can get some really good college students, some people who have jobs but are, can come on for an hour. Um, and you also, there's a like some stuff online now with tutoring that may make it better just because like we're doing some of these, we're doing a test with an AI driven uh, uh, coach for tutors as they go on. So there's potential that the online system because it can collect information and give you back information or give the tutor back information, it's got some quality potential. But not surprisingly, it also has downsides. Um, you want to know if it's not so good because it has kind of fixed costs to set up since you need a computer, students to have computers, you need to kind of figure out the schedules of how you would get the kids into places where they can do this. And there's lots of reasons you might think, particularly for younger kids, that it's got less effectiveness because um, it may be hard to create a relationship in a situation like we're in right now. Um, plus, so young students in particular may differ um, from other students because basically they may have a harder time paying attention online. Um, so the studies from the virtual programs of older kids might not generalize here. Okay, so we're going to look at a program called On Your Mark, um, which is a virtual one-on-one -on -one tutoring program that's embedded in the school day. They do 20 minute sessions. These are little kids um, four times a week with the consistent tutor. So they have the same tutor to build that relationship. They, um, they do it in kindergarten, which is basically five-year-olds and then first grade, six-year-olds, second grade, seven-year-olds. They do it, th that they're in all three of those grades. They use a very kind of scripted curriculum based on what we call the science of reading. So it's focused on phonics, phonological awareness, and kind of fluency. Um, they do these kind of two-week lesson sprints where they uh, target specific literacy skills, and then they do a lot of assessment along the way to understand what the students know or don't know. Um, and they, it's the tutors are quite well trained. They have an initial training and then they meet regularly in groups to kind of go over things focused on both the pedagogy and the content. So that's the program. Okay, so the randomization, sample and randomization. So during the 22-23 school year, a charter management organization called Uplift in Texas partnered with On Your Mark um, to provide tutoring to kindergarten, first grade, and second grade in 12 of, in 12 of its schools. It's a big it's a big charter management organization. Charters are just, they're kind of like districts in the US, um, except that they they get charters so that they can get a uh, they don't have to follow all of the regulations, but they are assessed on outcomes. Um, so there were 2,085 uh, students that we paired um, based on similar literacy skills. So we put them in pairs and um, within each um, classroom, within each school, pairs of students were first randomly assigned to receive tutoring. So we had, we have all these 2,085 kids, I guess there must be one left out here that, that got into groups of two. The groups of two were sorted, and you'll see why we're doing this, sorted 
randomized into treatment and control. And I have a little graph to show us this. Um, then after we did that, then the pairs of students who were assigned to the control group just got the business as usual, except they were randomly ordered onto a wait list because the if people dropped if kids dropped out of tutoring this you may have seen this before they the district will want to be able to give tutoring to other kids and so we had to randomly assign the waitlist to to make up for that and then among the pairs of students who were selected for tutoring we randomly assigned so half of the pairs got one on one tutoring and half of the pairs got two on one tutoring so that's why we put them in pairs so that they, um, you wanted the pairs, you we because some of these pairs were getting tutored together, They it was important for us to match them by similar literacy skills because otherwise the tutoring wouldn't be very effective if we got some who knew how to read and some who didn't know at all. So we paired them initially. So with their skills, we randomized tutoring and non-tutoring and then we randomized pairs to one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-two. So there was a glitch. Not surprisingly, these are fast turnarounds. So our, our glitch, which I think will show you, it makes a difference, but not huge, um, is that special education students and students who are English language learners, multi-language learners, get additional services and they get different services. And so they were not supposed to be in this sample because there are reasons they have to get the services that they got. And so the ones in our both the ones in the treatment group and the ones in the control group ended up getting the services that they were supposed to get, meaning that for the treatment students, they didn't really get the tutoring. So we prefer, there. it's balance between the treatment and control, whether we have IEP or MLL students in there. We prefer the samples that don't have them in, that don't include them in this because um, basically they got the same thing in another place. Um, the, the treatment and control got the same thing. But anyway, you'll see it with both with and without, but generally this, our sample is a little smaller because this whole thing that we did initially can, included the special education and the English learners and it probably should not have. Okay, so. Ah. Having trouble going forward. That's so weird. Okay, so we're basically asking what is the effect of virtual early literacy student tutoring on students' performance and what's the effect of group size? We have both of those two things built into here. Um, we have beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year measures of something called um, dynamic indicators of basic literacy skills or DIBBLES. DIBBLES is like a really common measure for us of phonics skills. There's also something called MWEA MAP reading scores. And that is, it's, you were not gonna find very much on MAP. It's um, the state test and um, it's a standardized test. It's a good standardized test, but it's on reading and the kids don't really read yet. So it's, it's not really a great test for this particular thing. We have another place where we're doing it and that place gives an early literacy map and or well, I guess they give an early literacy score for uh, state in our study in Florida has the early literacy in before they go into the reading one, but this one just has reading ones. It's not great, but I'll show them to you anyway. We have student demographic data. We know the number of tutoring sessions and school attendance, tutor demographics, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, the sample. Okay, so we got good balance between the one-on-one, -on -one, one on two and business as usual control group. Um, none of the p-values are bad. Um, this is in the paper and you can look at it, but it basically shows um, how many we had, how we randomized to the one-on-one, -on -one, one on two business as usual, this crossover and attrition. So we had some of the control group move into the treatment group when some of the treatment group left, but we're gonna analyze it based on assignment anyway, but the, you'll you'll see what that is. And then we'll do a treatment on the treated. So the, we're gonna do an intent to treat because there was some of that movement. Susanna, in, in, right. terms, of, in terms of uh, uh, end line, response rate to the tests. It's like it was it was run 
within the schools, like like as a, as a standard thing that happens, and therefore you have no not much problem with this. Is that that's right? the the uh, assessments themselves are run by the school. Yeah, we don't okay. have much problem with that. Okay, let me see. Um, I think I have this next one. Is that yes? You can. Yeah. Yeah, I see. See this. So we do have treatment predicts withdrawn from here because they they withdrew a bunch of the the uh, uh, special education and um, language English language learner students on the bottom. You can kind of see that, and this effect is bigger for the treatment than the controls. So that's really what explains the treatment having a bigger withdraw uh, number withdrawn, but. It doesn't really matter because we're not missing the end of year exams on very many people and we're going to do an intent to treat anyway. Does that make sense? So they withdrew from tutoring, but they're going to be in our sample. Okay. Just one question. Yeah. I missed it. Um, all these kids are in the same, like all the one like who are paired together. Do they know each other? They are. They're in the same class. Same class. Those who are yeah. paired. Okay. It's actually, a lot of the kids know each other. We have school, but well, they're in the same grade. We have school by grade fixed effects in there. And then we cluster the standard errors at the student pair level. Okay. Do you think that's the right way? I would, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally open for suggestions, but that we no, thought- no, I was just the, trying to understand, like, because it was COVID and they're very young. Like some, like they, in theory, they know each other, but because it's just not the same grade and they haven't been to school much, maybe they don't. Like it's. Oh, yeah, though this was the 22, 23 year. So they're all oh, back okay, in right. school. Okay, okay. Sorry. So they're, that's, that's <laughs> okay. They're all back okay. in school and it's okay. within grade, within school that the okay. randomization cool. occurs. Thanks. Okay. So here you can see all the different ones. This is the effect on dibbles. So if we do just the full sample with no controls in it, we get about a 0.097, but um, we don't really like we the controls. They're, they're not saying none of these are significantly different from each other, but basically the one we like the best has all the controls and doesn't include the um, multi-language learners or the students with disabilities. And that's at about 0.075. Um, so basically, you can see when we put in um, the second column includes, oh, I guess the third column include doesn't include the students with disabilities, but does include the multi-language learners, the study with the one at the this the next one doesn't include the multi language learners, but includes the students with disabilities, and then you get the one that has both of them. And I think that's the cleanest one, just because of the the knowing what they actually received. The because the business as usual, it's a it's a cleaner comparison. But you could have any of these. Um, then we do the map. And it's, you know, it's not statistically different from zero. Okay, so then we have group size. Um, it's, I mean, it's funny to present because it takes a, like a long time to run these things, but then to say, well, what is the estimate? Here's the estimate. And we pre-registered all of these. So it, we did exactly what we said in the pre-registration. Um, just on, so, the, on the, the reading scores, because you're saying yeah. at that age, they don't read. So if you just take the the top of the distribution, uh, do you see something? Yeah. I'll show you what it, yes, we'll go down to the top of the distribute. There's a, there is a small, these are generally lower achieving kids. So there's a small group in the top and I'll show you what they, you, you have there. Um, then we did one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-two. Now to be uh, fair to this program, they operate one on one. So their program is a one on one program, and they did one on two for us to test it. One on one is more effective. It could be that after years of doing one on two, they might get better at it, 
But basically across the board, we found approximately doubling effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one versus one-on-two. So um, here it's not significant in 0.048 for um, the dibbles in the model that for everybody, I mean, for without the um, students with disabilities and multi-language learners versus 1.112. And then even on the map where you don't see anything significant, it's still the point estimates are twice as big. Then you can do a treatment on the treated. So basically because we had this, um, you know, some kind of movement in there, um, we could do a, a base, you know, it's basically just uh, increasing by the, the proportion that actually received the tutoring. We're getting um, about a 0.1 effect overall, a 0.15 for one-on-one -on -one tutoring and a 0.06 that's not significant for two-on-one -on -one tutoring. And I have this actually later as extra if you wanted to see what it is for the full sample with, you know, including the multi-language learners. And, uh... Okay, so then we've got some heterogeneity here. And this is, um, I think, the question that, that you were asking, Nina. Um, so if you... Most of our sample, you can see 623 kids were well below benchmark, benchmark, 247 were below benchmark, 220 were at benchmark, and 73 were above the benchmark, you know, we're doing well. Um, basically, we find more positive results. Oh, I guess this is, is this just dibbles? Do, do I have, ah, I don't have the other one, so I don't have the reading one. We... Basic, this is the one group that we have enough where you can really see whether something is statistically significant and it looks pretty strong at that level. So um, here you're getting up to 0.14 for one-on-one -on -one tutoring for that, for that lowest group. So that's, is that true to, to say that on that outcome, we do expect them to benefit most while on the reading outcome, you would expect the top. That's, the, that's what exactly. And I should look, I I don't have it uh, up on here. I thought I did. Oh, no worries. Okay, so then this one is looking grade by grade and we find bigger effects. Um, it's interesting that we don't have it there though in the second grade, because you would think that the map score, you might get something better in second grade, but we really didn't find as much of an effect for second graders as we did for kindergartners and first graders. So again, our sample size gets small, so it's hard to see things that are statistically significant. Most of the statistical significance comes in the first grade, but that's also where our sample is the biggest. Um, so, you know, first grade, one-on-one -on -one for dibbles, you get close to 0.19, but all these things are really quite similar to each other. Here you are finding an effect on MAP. So maybe um, maybe there's something there that, that the first graders are beginning to learn to read, but I don't really know why we don't see much in the second grade. They may just not have been, they were later to coming to second grade to tutoring and maybe they just didn't do a good job. It's it's been a little hard for us, and I'd love your thoughts if you have have done early literacy assessments or, or studies, which assessments you use, because it does seem to make such a difference in the early grades what's actually covered. And I can show you where you can break these down into different things. And here we're going to get such small. Um, the reliability gets lower when you break it down into things and the numbers aren't very big because they cover different things in different grades. But um, so the Dibbles test actually has different subscores in these different grades, which could possibly explain the, some of the different effects. But the bigger numbers here are on phenome segmentation and letter sound identification on the Dibbles test in... Um, Kindergarten, 
where in first grade, it's more kind of across the board and they do letter sound identification, decoding, word reading, passage reading and reading accuracy. So they're kind of beginning to get into the reading side and we're getting significant positive effects on all of these for one-on-one -on -one tutoring anyway. Susanna? Yeah. Do you, I probably missed it, sorry, but like, were there guidelines on what exactly the tutors were doing, were teaching? You know, maybe they were just yeah. focusing more on some things and less on others, or like, or was it completely free? Like how hard did it? it? It's a, sorry, it's a very scripted curriculum. So they do follow quite a scripted um, progression through, and they do it in these little bursts, but they, they cover a bunch of these things that Dibbles covers. It's, it's kind of focused on the things covered by Dibbles. So it's phonological awareness that goes into kind of fluency. So reading, trying to, to read words quickly, essentially. But it definitely starts out with the letter sounds, um, you know, through three letter word kind of things. Okay, so, so that's that's really like vowel, in line in line okay. with what the with what the, the the literature on the methods to learn how to read is saying. Exactly. It's very aligned to that. Okay. So that's pretty much there was one other thing that we randomly assigned in here that was crossed, but I don't have the results of that yet, which was just like some extra coaching for the tutors. But um, I will I will analyze that soon. My guess is from the thing I've done, looked in other places and how much training these tutors get, I don't think it'll make much of a difference, but I will have that at some point. But I think the takeaway for me is that they did... It did seem to have a positive effect on students reading. It's not as big an effect as some of the um, tutoring that goes on that's been studied in other places. Um, so it might mean that virtual tutoring isn't quite as effective. We don't have a comparison to what it would be if it was in person. The traditional approach that On Your Mark takes, the one-on-one -on -one is much more effective than the one-on-two. Um, even though there's like a lot of push to move things to one on two, one on three, one on four. We we observed some of the, we've observed some virtual tutoring where the numbers get bigger, not in this group. Um, and it is, um, it, it's just hard for the tutor to kind of control the kids when, even in middle schools, when you've got more than, you know, when you've got a lot of them there. And with little kids, maybe it's even at the one-on-one, one-on-two. One on I think as you get older, there might be some benefits to one-on-two, but we don't see that here. One of the things we do have is all the videos of this. So we're currently analyzing the those for, um, using kind of natural language processing techniques. So we've made transcripts out of all of the videos um, and we're doing some things, but nothing that I, um, that uh, is ready, that is ready to share. But if you're interested in that, I'd love your thoughts on what are the, some of the kinds of things we should measure, or if you've seen people measure things um, using that kind of approach where we're just in kind of the measurement we've, we have, we're creating measures of basically how much time they spend on the literacy content versus the um, versus the social emotional kind of stuff versus just management of time or wasted time. We have the percent of time the tutors speak versus the students speaking. And we're trying to create measures of student engagement so that we can see if some tutors are better able to kind of engage students in the process, but we're not really there yet. So, okay, so virtual tutoring can be effective. One-on-one -on -one is more effective than one-on-two. Um, it appears that it's effective at least for students who are well below benchmark, which is important because that's where a lot of these places want to target it and we're getting good results there. I'm a little skeptical about comparing across the different levels because of the different kinds of assessments. But if you feel like there are ways that we can do that, I'd be really interested in that. Um, on Your Mark was better at first grade and kindergarten than, in sec than dealing with second grade, though again, the alignment is an issue here. And um, 
I think the real question becomes what is the cost effectiveness of online versus in person? There are times when you can only do online and then this seems to say that it's effective. Whether I doubt that it's the most cost effective way of doing this. We have another program that we've studied that has pretty good effects. The assessments again are have some problems with them, but it has subs- what I think of as substantially bigger effects, even with those problems than this does. And it's an in-person, in the in-person setting. So anyway, that is that is what I have on this. And I would love your thoughts or a conversation about what would be useful um, either in the study or um, in the project more broadly. Ah, chats. Great, thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Susanna. So please, please, please go ahead and ask your questions. Here, I'll, I'll stop the sharing um, so I can see you. So I don't know uh, uh, who is, uh, yeah, uh, Bastien? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Super interesting work. Um, and, and really well presented. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I was wondering, um, sorry, I'm uh, based at Sciences Po in, in Paris, by the way, assistant professor, um, and I worked on COVID and learning. In this. Um, I was wondering if you've looked at um, differences or heterogeneity by socioeconomic background at all. Do you have that in the data and do you have any findings on that? Um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, we have some measures of it in the d- data. I can l- look and see. Um, generally, this is a low income. I should have described the the place a little bit better. It is a, a low income uh, serving school, so pretty right. much a hundred percent of the kids are going to be eligible for uh, free or reduced price lunch, which is kind of the measure that we have. Gotcha. Thanks. That's interesting. Uh, Nina? Yeah, so you, you talked about it uh, like briefly at the end, but I was actually, when you said that you that you have the videos and stuff, I was uh, pretty keen in knowing whether you're doing stuff on, on the teachers also, like the tutors, exactly who they are, like whether you have, I don't know, stuff like, I think... For now, evidence shows like that the big five of the teachers and all like doesn't doesn't help much uh, knowing about that. But is it also something that you say? And I I mean I don't have much more than what you just said, which is level of involvement involvement of the kids and stuff. I think there's the class uh, thing. I don't know if you have that in mind that where well, they did you know take pictures, but yeah. it's in class, so it's probably very different from what you can do like face like on a on a screen. So yeah, just curious about that. Yes, yeah, so that that's the kind of thing that we want to do, and there, um, the class. I think it it is a lot about how they manage the classroom, and um, so in, I'm not sure that's the right one. But I hear that the University of Oregon, and I I have the link to it. I just we just haven't used it yet. Has a measure of of kind of good uh, teaching of early literacy, and so we're hoping to code to code that and then to see if if we coded, you know, I don't know, uh, 500 hours of it or something, could the computer then learn how to take that and apply it? Um, so I think that would be really cool to be able to do something like that. Right now we've been doing something that is more, um, uh, more counting, like the words and and stuff like that, which is much, you know, easier. But I, I think that that's, really useful. We have we have been using some in the NLP stuff, um, teachers for something else where we've we had this little chatbot for um helping tutors help with math mistakes. Like what just giving them little suggestions about things they can do um if their student makes a mistake in math. And that's with a different tutoring program. But um, there we've compared what they do, what the chatbot tells them to do with what like expert teachers think they should be doing. And it gets us closer to the expert teachers by doing the chatbot, but not as good as it's not not as uh, far along as we would like to be. OK. And I say we, but really it's it's like the people here who know how to do NLP and write these um, 
you know, large language models or whatever those are called. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, talking about the, the relatively small effect sizes, of course, this all depends on what the control group is doing. And here, at least from first grade, the control group is already learning to read in class, right? Yes. So, of course, the quality of teachers and manuals varies, but still, it's a pretty strong control group. And and I imagine that, I mean, as we know, for most kids, it's enough. So, so the the one on one tutoring tries to add something extra, but it's probably legitimate only for those who are struggling to to learn in class. And uh, you you had some some suggestions that this is the case, right? That the effect is stronger for them. And I'm also thinking of another potential uh, moderating factor, which is that since you said that the curriculum is quite uh, rigid, it means that it cannot adapt to what the teacher is doing in class. So potentially there is a complete disconnect such that pupils are are learning to read twice a day, once in class and once with the tutor, potentially with completely different methods, completely different progressions. This doesn't sound very optimal, does it? Yeah, that's true. Um, I think, and I, but I actually think it's less of a problem in early literacy than it is for tutoring in other areas. And that's a little bit because at least um, here, there's a pretty straight progression in early literacy. Like you tend to learn, maybe you don't learn exactly the same letters, like someone will know an S and another person will know a T because their name has an S or a T in it. But generally, you learn in a quite rigid way in early or a quite linear way in early uh, in early reading and in phonics. And because of that, the pro the tutors can see where they are in that progression um, and come in and help in late, like in math and stuff like that, they may have missed, you know, understanding the number line or adding fractions or whatever it is. There, there are all these things that different kids might have missed and they, that, um, and they are aligning with what's going on in class is, is I think more important than it is in early literacy. But I think you're right in early literacy too, that it's good if it, if it aligns, um, the pro the other program that we have an RCT for um, is kind of a cool program because what they do is they put somebody in the classroom who works with the students kind of five to 10 minutes a day every day over the school year, um, particularly the ones who are struggling. And um, so they vary if they work with them every day or every uh, two days or something like that. Um, but what's nice is they're in the classroom so that they can see what's going on in the classroom um, instead of having to always do something independent. But reading, while a lot of kids learn to read, there are a good chunk of kids in the U.S. that just aren't learning how to read. And so there's it's it does seem like we need to do something beyond what the teachers are doing in the classroom. Thanks. Susanna, the question I had is, is, is maybe a test of Frank's uh, comment in a sense. So I was going to ask, so um, maybe you said it, but I'm, I'm not sure how much you said it. Um, at that same level, do we have stronger evidence of in-person tutoring? Which I think you, you seem to say, so maybe you could be more specific. Yeah. With that. Because if this is the case, that you do have strong enough effects for in-person tutoring, then in-person tutoring would face the same issues as Frank has described. It's not related to to to, to video particularly, right? It's a, it's a problem of articulating uh, uh, what happens in class and, and what happens uh, during tutoring. So that would not be the, the, the reason if in-person would work better. Uh, but then, right. then the question I... is why, why should it work much better than, than video? It's not completely clear to me. But so, so what is the, what, what do we know? So um, yes, there is a lot of evidence on early literacy, in-person tutoring. I think there are four or five meta-analyses of RCTs that have looked at. Uh, tutoring's nice because it's one of the easier things to randomize so that you do have uh, randomization of there for the in-person ones. Now, these are also pre-COVID right now 
kids are kind of, a, the young kids are a bit of a mess after being in COVID. So it's a little harder to compare to that. But, um, and then, you know, I've been looking at meta-analyses. You probably all look at meta-analyses a lot, but I'm kind of newer to the RCT world of like lots of RCTs and thinking about how to pull them together. There are a lot of terrible meta-analyses out there. I'm not quite sure um, if I completely uh believe the approach of meta-analysis just because like I understand it if it's the exact same outcome and um and and similar programs just evaluated a lot a lot of times but when you're pulling them together you're testing you're you're using assessments that are so close to what you're you're um what you're focused on in the project or so far away, and then you're saying, "Well, this one has a bigger effect." So I'm, I, I'm really worried about which assessments uh, places are using and whether we can compare them. Nonetheless, the the meta analyses tend to put it more at like the point uh, four level for early literacy, and this is going to be obvious to you, but point four. Point four is way bigger than you're going to see in the upper grades. But for this grade, because you learn almost a standard deviation in kindergarten versus like in high school where you learn point one of a standard deviation, a point four effect isn't as huge. It's like it's well, it's about 40 percent of a year. So it's it's big, um, but it isn't unreasonable like it being four years as it would be in in. Um, uh, yeah in high school. So mm. I don't know, you all must think about these things a lot and how how we make these comparisons when they use measures that are more closer or farther away. I think Dibbles is okay because while it is close to what they're focused on, it's um, such a general test that everybody gives and kids progress along that there are enough places that have you can actually compare Dibble's results across places. But when they start to use some of the other assessments, I'm I'm more concerned that they're finding bigger or smaller effects because of what mm -hmm. what they're measuring. Um, and you... yes, there is. Sorry, yes, there is early literacy in vert in person, and it runs into some of the same problems. Except when you're in person, you might talk to the teachers more. So that's one reason that it might not be mm. as uh, bad. Right. Right. Okay. But but in the other direction. So what you're mentioning is that the effect size of at this very early stage are not much lower than the effect size that you get more generally on tutoring. You've you've talked about the same order of magnitude. Yeah, like yeah. Maybe it's that 30%, 40% of the standard deviation, it seems to, to be around there. Um so in person it seems to be like like consistent across across levels. I mean it it, it seems to work with the same kind of effect size uh. across the levels, right? Here, video. So we have this. I don't know how many papers we have. I I don't know many of them, but I, I know the Michela, Carlana, and, and Eliana paper. They they have much, pretty much stronger effects at a different level, right? But wh why should there be on video? Uh, is there something related to the age of the, the age of the kids that right. that, so that video is is less of an efficient uh, way with younger kids, whereas with older kids, it's almost as good as in person, or is there, is there a, a... That's, that is the basically, the, that's basically the concern. It's like when you, cause we do look at some of these videos and sometimes the kids are like this, you know? <laughs> they're, they're not paying attention at all, right? And it's, it's hard when you can't kind of walk around to where they are and pull them back in. And so I, I do think there's something like that um, in Michaela's study too, I don't know how much of the benefit like was because the kids when they were doing that, though I think they may have some more recent results, but I thought they were smaller, but the kids were doing it during the pandemic. So they were online anyway. Yeah. And so maybe I, it could be an age difference or it could be that that's just what they were doing at that point. And you might have the same thing with older kids on virtual, that it wouldn't be quite as effective if uh, in a more natural school setting. Um, one of the problems in the school mm -hmm. setting is you've got, you know, kids are on computers in a classroom 
and these two kids are sitting there with a computer like this, but there's another group, you know, three feet away from them doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's different than the setting that um, Michaela was looking at during the pandemic where the kids were home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dustian, maybe your last question. If that's all right, thanks. I, I was curious if you um, are planning to to follow them um, into the future and to maybe test them again, both the treatments and the control, um, or what do you expect about possible fade outs of these effects? I guess generally in this literature on early childhood interventions with other outcomes as well, I guess there's a worry about that. Do you see that here or, or, or not yeah. so much? So we do want to we we do hope to follow them. And similarly, in this in-person one that we're doing, we're hoping to follow them. There is a little bit of attrition where kids leave the, because we we have district specific. They have to stay in the district and the numbers go down. But uh, I'm hoping to follow them, particularly because there's that. Well, for us, there is a transition in the kind of third to fourth from um basically learning to read to reading to learn. So there's like the comprehension stuff. There's the engagement in school issues. Um, so I think the benchmark that everybody wants to affect is that like third, fourth grade reading. Um, and right. so that's that's the goal of most of the places that we're in. So we're going to try to follow them there. I I do think that's true that we get lots of fade out of these things, but it's it been interesting in the early ed stuff where we see fade out on the academic uh, measures, but then we see that it seems to kick in um, on other kinds of things as you go forward, um, even really quite far into the future. Um, um yeah. Again, you know, there are these things where tests are supposed to be vertically aligned, but I I think it is hard to to um know so if is it fade out of the effects or is it just um that kids are actually learning much more things and the the assessments are covering more things i think we actually need as a group to all think together about what it means to look at the progression of learning over time um, because you can imagine that there's some kind of specific skills they get that helps them to learn more later. And so you would then see that it's, it's it sustains over time. But there's got to be some things that you learn that just get to be a smaller part of all of the things that you learn later. Um, so sometimes I think we see drop offs and then a kind of stability of an effect. And that could be because that stability is kind of how it affected the stuff that that is uh, more general learning. Uh, yeah. But I, totally. I'm not quite sure we figured that out as well as we should. Sounds interesting and great that you'll follow them. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think we're, we are we are about through our time, unless there is a another question. All right, so thank you very much, Susanna, for this very uh, interesting presentation and, and discussion. Uh, let me just mention that um, next month they, we have the, uh, the entire day uh, seminar, but it will be in uh, Grenoble at the Larac uh, 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 lab, Pascal Bressou, but it will be retransmitted on Zoom so you can follow it uh, if, even if you don't want to to travel to uh, to Grenoble. And, and, and the topic will be uh, uh, measuring uh, teacher practice. Very standard yeah. issue, but we'll try to see what, what, what we have and what is the frontier uh, for this. So you're very welcome. Uh, Great. Everyone. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you very thank you much. Very, thank you a lot, Susanna. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.